This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by Adam Audio, Isotope, Native Instruments, and Grace Design. You're hearing my voice right now through the Grace Design M201 Mark II mic preamp into the Empirical Labs EL8X distressor mixed through Isotope RX, Ozone, Neutron, and Nectar, all on Adam Audio monitors. Please check out our awesome sponsors using the links in the show notes. It's a great way to help support this show, and we really appreciate it. Now, get ready to rock. Here's the thing about audio. Here's the thing about songwriting. Here's the thing about life in general. It's like developing your palate. Over the course of years, you start to learn about wine. Then you start to learn about what wines work with food. There's so many different elements involved in in picking a wine that helps the experience become a better experience. And it's the exact same thing with music. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Adam Audio celebrates 25 years of designing industry-leading monitors in Berlin by unveiling the Arctic White A4V and A7V monitors, available for a limited time. With the XART ribbon tweeter design, customizable speaker voicings, and Sonarworks integration for room correction, these monitors deliver professional-grade sound perfect for Grammy-winning producers and home studios. Make your studio cooler than cool with the Arctic White A4V and A7V available for a limited time with the standard extended five-year warranty at adamaudio.com. Are you struggling to make your mixes sound professional? If your tracks feel weak, distant, or lack punch and clarity, I've got the perfect solution. My free course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will teach you how to achieve pro-level mixes from your home studio using free and stock plugins in Pro Tools. But these techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you use Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, Reaper, or another. If you're ready to make your best record ever, go to Mix masterbundle.com to get started now for free. Find the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Howdy, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw. Welcome back to Recording Studio. Rock stars bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Roger Allen Nichols, an all-around musician, songwriter, engineer, producer, mixer, and owner of Belltone Recording here in Nashville, Tennessee. His producing and engineering credits include a Grammy-nominated project with Larkin Poe and artists like Haley Williams of Paramore, Steven Tyler, Tyler Bryant and The Shakedown, Kim Ritchie, and many others in rock, country, and Americana genres. I'm sure we there's many more I should have listed in there too, but that's what I got for now. <laughs> From 1981 to 1989, Roger toured the 50 United States and Canada professionally as a guitarist with multiple rock bands. During a brief stint in Atlanta, he had, he attended the Art Institute. Look at you go, man. <laughs> and continued doing, he's sipping his espresso while I say that. I ran out of Monet. <laughs> <laughs> and continued doing sessions and performing with regional acts. Roger then moved to Nashville and formed the alternative rock band Dreaming in English. Check the acronym, rock stars. See if you can figure that one out. And I remember those guys. I remember hearing all about them and hearing their music on the radio here and um, and then finally meeting Roger one day in a local YMCA as we were both thinking, man, we need to hit the gym and, you know, survive this rock and roll lifestyle. Your mohawk, man. Oh, yeah, That's I had what a mohawk remember. back then. That was awesome. And then I was, but Roger had like tattoos, you know. <laughs> um, The band toured the Southeast, gaining a large fan base before releasing their debut album, Stuff, in 1998. 
to critical acclaim. Shortly after that, Rogers signed a publishing deal as a writer with Acuff Rose Idea Music, and through this publishing deal, he started producing and engineering his demos. Eventually, he established his own studio where he began producing and writing with and for other artists, which we mentioned earlier, Belltone Recording. As a multi-instrumentalist, Roger has written and produced tracks for Showtime, HBO, MTV, Spike TV, as well as three major networks. His diverse playing and producing skills were showcased in the trailer music for Mission Impossible 3, don't, no, 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 national TV com- campaign. And most recently, he composed the music for Bluebird, a documentary of the legendary Nashville venue where numerous songwriters had be- advanced their careers. Um, you can check out Roger's previous episodes here on Recording Studio Rockstars at RSR45, taking the Wayback Machine there, talking about his start in recording and RSR286 when uh, Roger joined us with Tyler Bryant at Belltone Recording in yeah. his studio. That was and fun. And I was over there. That was a so fun that was, day. That was super fun, man. Please welcome Roger Allen Nichols back to Recording Studio Rockstars. Roger, my man. Lidge, always good to see you, my friend. Are you ready to rock? I am rock, ready. Rock, rock, rock. <laughs> Good to have you back, dude. Great to be back, man. And, and for the listeners out there, I just uh, left Lidge's studio, and it's it might be one of the best sounding rooms I've been in in a long time. I mean, it is unbelievable in there. I um, I was blown away. I mean, if you need something mixed, if you need something done, I mean. I, uh, you need to be calling Lidge because this, you can hear every detail and it's incredible how that place sounds. Make, uh, yeah. Hire, come to my studio to mix it, but maybe hire Roger to do the mixing. Too. Hire me that, to mess it up. That'd be a good idea. Hire me to create more work for Lidge. <laughs> Messer. Messer of audio. Messer of audio. Yes. Um, so dude, tell us about what's new with you, man. What's, what's new over at Belltown? Um, maybe describe the studio one more time. Cause it's got a cool history. You know, you, you moved in. And yeah. took over from from Richard Dodd. Richard Dodd. Yeah. So it's a funny story, and I've I've told this story um, on several occasions. Um, when I moved to town in '89, um, we were looking for the the band was out of Boston. I was coming up from Atlanta, and we were looking for a place to uh, start our band. And New York, L.A., and Los Angeles were the three places we were looking at. Nashville was made the most sense financially and we were all east coast guys but the we middle were, coast yeah we were we were you know being a rock band though uh, it was we were a little ahead of the curve i think or at least a little early premature um but we moved we found a house in berry hill that we moved into and uh it was great it had a it was owned by this ecumenical film company it had a theater in the back and uh 12 rows of theater seats and you know we built a riser we hung a PA, we built a control room and we turned all the offices into bedrooms and we lived there and rehearsed. And when I say rehearsed, we were militant. Yeah. I remember we, you told us about this stuff too on the first episode and it was really cool to hear the stories. I mean, like just going back and listening a little before this one and, and remembering you talking about like, you know, your first band, like you'd been in a band together from third grade, like all the way through high school and stuff. Yeah, there's something about, man, I just love bands. I just, yeah. you know. But anyways, the 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 studio I'm in now is next door to that house. And um, it... Um, and what was the house where you guys were rehearsing? Was it the it, Treasure Isle studio or was it on the other side? It was it was on the back side of the house that we were renting, which is where GC Pro has their custom house now in Barry Hill. Oh, yeah. All right. So, um, um, and our keyboard player um, lived in the house that I'm in now. Um, and when he moved out, Richard, uh, had moved over here from the UK and bought the house and turned it into a studio. And then during the pandemic, uh, the studio I was in in Berry Hill, um, uh, was sold. I, you know, I was, it was a cash deal, 14 day closing. I was in the middle of a record and freaking out. So I was looking for a space to move to. It was such a great location that you had too. Yeah. So yeah. I know it was stressful because you're like, how am I going to do this well again? And then. Yeah. Well, in, in, and you know what it's like. You got to get used. I mean, you got to get used to the room and what you're hearing. There's a whole learning. Yeah. Yeah. When, I, when I moved into the space I'm in now, I was mixing a record, uh, was started to mix a record for an artist that uh, I had already did numerous mixes for. And um, 
uh, I started mixing and I just, I, I didn't have the room figured out yet. And the mixes I turned in cost me the gig, you know? Um, and that was, uh, you know, I was just in the new space or in, yeah, the, previous in the new one? in a new space. Well, so, well, that's a bummer. You know, it's that's a bummer, but the, the, you know, the conclusion of what I was getting at too is your last space was so awesome that it'd be easy to think, how am I going to luck out again like this? And then the new place you're in is even better. It, I, it really, I mean, it's, you know, it, there's not a day that goes by that I don't walk in there and go, oh man, I just, you know, I love getting there and, uh, and working. And I finally understand the room. So the, you know, over the last couple of years, the, the mixes that I've been doing there are, are what I was shooting for initially, right. you know, but as you know, um, it, uh, it takes a little bit of time to kind of understand what you're hearing and stuff. And I did, a I, I just upgraded some speakers, um, about six months ago, which was a huge, um, because you, haven't you been on Dyn Audios for yeah. ages and ages? I was on air 15s for almost 20 years. And I, I knew those speakers in my old location. Um, as most of you will know out there, uh, in, in recording world, um, one way to combat issues in the room that you might have is to eliminate the room. And the way you eliminate the room is have the speakers fairly close. And uh, for years, that's how I worked. I had the speakers, the dines right, you know, right I could reach face, out my right? hands yeah. and touch the dines. And, um, and so that, you probably trained yourself to know what to expect yeah. when listening like that too. Yeah. Um, but there was some underlying issues I had with the Air 15s. I love the Air 15s. I love how they're designed because there's a there's a thing that they do where they it reduces the fatigue. Uh, the way they're designed, you can listen for longer periods of time with less fatigue. Um, but it was a tweeter and a 10 inch woofer, and the port it was ported in the back, and um, I did not. Um, I was not a fan of that. And when I when I moved to the spot spot I'm at now. The stuff I started struggling with, I had never struggled with before because I now had the speakers back further because the room sounded so good. I had the speakers back further, which allowed the low end to develop more. And Right, right. Yeah, when, so you, was, when you had them up close, did you find it was most helpful to always work at lower, low volume? Uh, if I were intelligent, I would say yes, but I'm an idiot. So I get in there and get excited when I hear stuff and I just crank it up and until, you know, I... Until you feel it. Until my nose bleeds, you know, yeah. it's just, you know, it's... Um, it is a challenge. I mean, it's a tricky thing about doing rock music. I'm sure it's tricky if you're doing, like, huge bass music, too, yeah. because you don't, especially because of the whole Fletcher Munson curve thing where you're not going to get, you're not going to hear that big bass unless you've got it cranked. Yeah. Sort of need it to sound like a sub. Yeah. It's, it, a hoopty, it, right? it's, it's a horrible habit to get into, you know? When I was down in your room listening, I was so impressed with how low you could listen and it still felt exciting and you yeah. could still hear the detail. I mean, really, you know, when you listen to NS10s down really low, it's, you know, you're going to hear the kick or the snare and the vocal really clear. Mm -hmm. And it's great for, you know, placing those things. Um, and then, of course, as you turn it up, then the bottom end starts to come, well, as much bottom end as you can get out of an NS10. Right. starts to come into focus. Um and the cone leaps out and touches you on the nose. <laughs> it starts tickling your cheek. Um, yeah, the you know the the your room sounds incredible. It's just really um, a room that's designed that well and sounds that good. I mean, that is a, you know I know it's an expensive investment, but if you think about what you're doing for the longevity of your hearing and your perception of how a mix sounds and stuff, it's, it's I'm sure it's worth. Well, that. it's funny to say that uh, as I think about an ex expensive investment, expensive implies you got to spend a chunk of money today on the thing. But the truth is we spend so much time listening to our monitors in our studios, making music, and we're going to do it for decades that it's like a more expensive investment not to put in the time and effort to get it right, you know, because it feels like... Um, it feels exhausting on the ears, you know, to spend years and years working in loud, echoey spaces. Yeah. It feels exhausting on your um, creative energy to mm -hmm. like expend it on stuff where you you're 
not getting what you want, all that kind of stuff. So. Well, there's a reason why they don't tint the front window of a car, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, the thing about, um, you know, the, the way your work um, out there in recording world, the way your work should work in your favor is you turn in good work and more people hear about you and it, it helps, you know, helps elevate your um, profile. It helps elevate the amount of work that you get. And if it's not set up properly, if you're not giving yourself the best opportunity to deal with something that sounds accurate or sounds good, um, if it's not fun to mix under those conditions or work or record under those conditions, then the work you're going to turn in is to a client is, uh, is going to be compromised. And that will cost you down the road. It'll cost, it'll affect your reputation. Um, you know, it'll affect all kinds of things. Um, so there's a, Dyn Audio is a, a Danish company. And uh, the Air 15, the Air Series speakers, were, they stopped manufacturing those in uh, 2016. So... Um, it was one, wasn't it one of the first digital, like digital to analog conversions yeah. right in the box yeah, going the, to the speaker self-powered. Yeah. There's a bunch of math involved in those cabinets. Yeah. It's, um, um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, what happened was there's, there's a, about maybe 10 years ago, I guess it was, um, the, the air 15s that I had needed uh, a software update and, uh, just, a blah, blah, blah. So I, um, I found a guy in Arizona outside of Phoenix that worked for Dyn Audio. He's a Danish guy. And, uh, I sent him the speakers. He's the only guy, there's two guys in the U S that work on those. And this is one of them. And, and, um, so I sent him the speakers and he fixed them and I, he sent them back. And, um, so six months ago, seven months ago, I guess it was, uh, I started having, uh, the, the left hand side started to fail. Uh, there was a problem with the power supply. And I was like, oh, here we go. So uh, I called the guy and he said, yes, send me the speakers. Um, so I packed them up, sent them down to him, and he fixed them. That cost me 400 and 400 and some plus dollars to mail them because they're heavy. Right. And uh, just, you know, uh, you're pissing money away, sending away, you know, sending, you know, mailing those things. But, um, so I sent him down, he fixed him, and uh, he called me, said, hey, they're ready to be picked, or they're ready to be shipped back. And I asked him what it cost, and he told me that what the repair cost, and I'm thinking of that plus the shipping, and I'm just going, oh, man. So we started to have a conversation, and Remember I told Remember the days where you just go down to the Southwest desk and just hand it over, yeah. and they'd fly it, pre-2001? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, so I, you know, we just started having a conversation about it. And I told him how much I love those speakers. But I said, but there were some problems that I was having, especially in, in this new space. And, and that was some definition in the mids. And I didn't feel like the bottom end was, uh, was, I didn't feel like it would extended low enough. And I hated that. I really grew to hate the rear port. So he says, well, what you really need are Dyne Air 20s. And I'm like, oh, well, tell me more. And he said, uh, it's a, it's a, it has a, it's just like the Air 15, has a 10 inch driver. It has a, uh, I think a three inch mid and a tweeter and it's front ported. So he said, um, he goes, these speakers were the last that they made. And he said, um, he goes, if you listen through these speakers, what you're telling me, he said, these speakers will resolve that issue. They go down to 31 Hertz, I think. And, um, uh, they're front ported and blah, blah, blah. So um, he says, I have, he said, they stopped making them in 2016, but I happen to have a pair here that I'm burning in right now. Um, he said, these are the only ones that are out of the series that are still in demand. So um, I was like, huh. So how, they, they, they sound a lot better than the 15s? Well, remarkably so. Yeah. But nice. they sound enough like what I was listening to that I was, you know, it wasn't a huge learning curve. Right. So that's a little bit of a testament to learning a brand. And and hopefully if it's a good brand that you're working with, when they upgrade and go to the next thing, yeah, it's going to, it's going to feel familiar. It's, I mean, like, you know, Adam Audio, of course, has been a sponsor on the podcast yeah. and they make great monitors. 
Um, and I think that's like probably a big focus of theirs too, is like, you've got, you know, you start out with something like the A7V uh, or the uh, um, A7X and then move up to yeah another series dark. and it'll feel familiar, you know? Yeah, they, I was surprised at how familiar it, I was so, so basically what the deal was that I worked out with him is I said, give me a day to think about this. The last thing I need to be doing is spending more money, but, um, but I'm curious. So I thought about it for a day. I called him the next day. I said, I'll do it. And he says, I'm glad you decided to. He said, because I've already had calls on these speakers within 24 hours. I'm like, okay. So we worked out a deal where I said, just keep my speakers and um, I'll pay for shipping and get this, you know, we, it was an easy transition. And he had burned them in. He had replaced a bunch of stuff and, and they're, you know, they were warranted and that whole thing. So I was like, yeah. what's burning them in mean? Well, you know, I, I think what happens is, is he updates the software and because there's a lot of math involved in all that stuff, I think that what he does is he just, he runs content through them for, you know, a week, I think it is. Just to just to make sure that everything is is stable and is you know there's no problems with this. he may have replaced one of the so I don't know if he replaced one of the drivers or not but uh, I'm sure that if he did that is part of the equation too yeah well I mean I've heard people talk about burning in headphones you know I think Jamie Tate was talking about getting a new pair of headphones and then plugging them in and just letting them play music all night mm -hmm. long you know because the drivers sort of you know it's the cones too they probably physically need to be exercised yep. to start to loosen up and move, move more freely so you can get the sound. That it's the same way with the guitar. With. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because guitars was my next question. <laughs> so your studio, Belltown Tone Recording, beautiful website, great pictures of the studio. And one of the things that you really showed off were guitars and amps. And of course, that's a world you come from. So how important is, is it to have a collection of guitars and amps for clients? Obviously, if we're making hip hop all day long, that might not matter. But for those of us that are working with guitar bands, yeah, um, what do you want to say that about the you know having how important is it to have that collection of guitars and amps for working with clients? Well, you know, how do I explain this? My studio is kind of interesting. It's it's a it's a commercial space, but it's not a commercial space. In other words. I'm not running advertisements in Music Row magazine and I'm not soliciting people to come in, but I do get calls where people want to come over and work and stuff. And I, I gladly welcome that because that helps me make the ends meet. So a lot of the guitars and the amps and stuff that I have are stuff that I have collected over the years from playing. Uh, it's really fun when you work with a young band because you get uh, you get all that energy and excitement and you get all that just... Uh, reckless abandon and all of, you know, all of the great things that come with young, hungry bands. Yeah. Um, one of the things that often doesn't come with a young, hungry band is good gear. Right. <laughs> and it, it's, it, uh, I, I find it helpful if, um, if I have that stuff readily available. And, and uh, I, I know the gear well enough to know that when I'm sitting down working on a track with someone or producing something or pr working with a band and we're going for a particular sound, I know where to look really quickly. So it does help save time. And um, yeah, it just kind of makes the thing go quicker. Um, the way that I've been recording guitars, um, the, what I've fallen into, the method that I've fallen into in recording guitars is I've got this... API line mixer. It's an 8200A, eight channel stereo API. And I used to years ago mix and sum through that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, this is back when Pro Tools didn't have the algorithms right and everything sounded crunchy when you were trying to sum mixing within Pro Tools. It, all that stuff's corrected now. It does To me, it's just, you know, it sounds great. Yeah. Um, but so I, I transitioned out of that. I, I, I felt like it, um, it was working against me at that point. So um, I threw it in a rack, and the way that I've been using it now is when I go to Micah Cabinet, for example, we're doing guitar overdubs, um, I'll, I'll mic, you know, I'll use a condenser mic, uh, like a large condenser mic. I'll use a ribbon and a dynamic mic. Um, and I'll run those into pre's, individual pre's, and then I come out of the... Um, out of the API, 
into a compressor. So it's just one single compressor for the three mics. And then what I'll do is I will use the volume knobs on the, on the line mixer to blend uh, the mics to get the sound the way I want it. Yeah. Um, I find using it that way, I use less EQ. I'm using the mics that and they're, way. And they're sort of blending down to a mono. They're blending down through a mono like and that. then through 1176 or a distressor or something, you know. Yeah, that, that's what I always loved about working on my MCI console so much, especially for guitar days. Same thing, I'd pull up the, di you know, I wouldn't be afraid to put up three mics on the guitar, yeah. three or four even. And then I'd just pull up faders until you stumble on a sound you like. And then part of the fun is like, who gives a fuck how you got that sound? Now you just got a sound you like now. Yeah. So and go. You and know? you got a sound that's going to be more unique than it's how easy is it to to go, oh, I'm cutting a guitar, just throw a 57 in front of the cabinet. You throw yeah. a 57 in front of the cabinet, you're going, oh, I'm going to cut some, I'm going to, I'm going to cut some of the bottom end. I'm going to brighten it a little bit, maybe, you know, whatever. Um, and you go, okay, that's cool. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, and when you, when I'm working this way, I can go, oh, there's a 57. Yeah, that sounds great. Oh, the 414. Wow. The 414 sound. I didn't expect that, you know? Yeah. So you, you kind of get this little pleasant reminder of what different mics sound like in that scenario. And, and it's, it becomes more interesting. I think when you're using that to kind of dial in the exact tone that you're looking for. Um, yeah, it's, it's your EQ. It, it is. becomes your EQ because each mic has a different frequency response. Um, do you practice the same thing on acoustic guitar? Do you put up a couple of mics sometimes? And sometimes, blend? yes. Yeah. No, normally when, um, you know, there's there's a, a record that I'm prepping for right now where the, the artist is a, uh, he's an acoustic guitar player and a songwriter and a singer. And we're, we're going through the process right now of choosing the songs. And this is a... Um, a legendary songwriter in Nashville and he's a hall of fame writer and, and uh, he's just writes the most brilliant songs. And we've been, we've been discussing doing this record. So he'll call me and say, Hey man, I'm in the neighborhood and I want to come by and record a new song. Sure. You know, so I'll just throw something up and he's done this three or four times. So every time he shows, shows up, I'm throwing up different mic combinations because I don't want to bore him with standing there while I'm switching stuff out. Right. And the whole time I'm making notes about, okay, this is his old Martin. This sounds really good on his Martin. You know, this don't ever pull out of the box again for his Martin. <laughs> you know, there's those little things that you kind of learn. So um, in, you know, through the multiple visits, I'm kind of doing the same thing. You know, um, I just never have the the time to prep for him because he's always just calling me at the last minute saying, hey, I'd like to come by this morning and it'd be like, please come on by. Hey, rock stars. Yeah, you, I've got a secret to tell you. Want to know how I get a consistent sound mixing over a thousand hours of recording studio rock stars? My secret is using Isotope, RX, Ozone, Neutron, Voice Enhancement Assistant, and Nectar to make sure every episode of this podcast sounds great. Right now, you are hearing RX Breath Control, D-Click, D-Clip, DS, Deplosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone Multiband Compression, Neutron EQ, VEA, and Limiting, all from Isotope. Use the secret code ROCK10 to get 10% off or pick up the new Trash Light along with many of the other free cool plugins over at isotope.com. Right, so what have you found? It sounds like writing a note is a successful way to do that for you. Have you explored different ways to keep track of how to get sounds with particular artists on particular instruments and and then concluded this is the best way to do it? Yeah, there's, um, you know, I've, I've made these little pieces of paper that I, um, you would see in a studio, a typical studio, which is where it has the inputs from the different rooms. And then it has a slot for the instrument. It has a slot for the mic pre, the EQ, the compressor and then what channel it goes in into Pro Tools. So when I'm miking up a kit, for example, um, you know, I'll put kick, you know, in, on channel one. And so it'll be in the first slot. It'll be in the drum room, first input, second input in the drum room, snare, or inside kick, you know, whatever the combinations are. And then I, I keep all of those notes because um, everyone with guitar, with acoustic guitar, 
with drum, every instrument basically, no player sounds the, the same. Right. And when you're pursuing a sound, you're making quick decisions about um, what to use or, oh, this is my go-to for this. Oh, it sounds horrible on this person. Don't use that again, you know? Um, so I keep all these sheets. And then when I'm, like, if I've got a project coming up, I might review some stuff that I've done and go, yeah, that kick, I love that sound. Um, how did I get that again? And I can look at my notes. And that kind of gives me maybe an, a, a planning uh, uh, procedure um, and to take that initial step with the artist as far as trying to get the sounds. It's, it, it really, man, it's, you, you know, you know, for the years that you've been making records, it's like you don't really have time sometimes to audition stuff or to do what, what a lot of people say is, you know, what you should do is it, sometimes you just got to throw a mic up and go. Yeah. So it, it's interesting to think about the, the note taking on sessions and hear you describe it. My first thought, my first reaction was, oh, you're not taking photos with your iPhone? Like, cause I've, I started doing that and I find that very helpful um, to just go out there and, you know, just take pictures of what mics were on things. But it just occurred to me that one of the reasons why your technique is so great and kind of beats the take pictures with your iPhones is because the truth is on those sessions that go so fast, I don't even have time to get up out of the chair and go over and take the picture with the iPhone because I'm busy in the control room. Yeah. And it kind of, it's, it's great to think about how it goes full circle. It's like it, it all began with a track sheet and taking notes and it kind of comes full circle. Yeah. It's like taking notes with a track sheet is the one thing that you can always do from the control room yep. and from the chair, from the chair. So I'm going to keep talking about that. So, so you, maybe can't get over there with a photo to take a picture of it because there just literally isn't enough time between overdubs or the person got up out of the chair and moved anyway, or the drummer tore down their drums before you got yeah, up over yeah. to the drum kit. That's happened to me so many times. Yep, yep. And even saying, well, why don't you just use the comments feature in Pro Tools? It, it just never really it's works for me. It's not the same. It, um, I'm always I'm always mildly terrified to start typing on the keyboard while the tracks are rolling. Yeah, because you hit one wrong, You're one wrong, one, one wrong, wrong key. space bar. You know, man, you I've, have I done that before? Take, you know, have I done that before so many times? And then I always dis I always disguise my um, the incident by like, oh, you know what? I I want to let's try this again. I'm sorry, that was operator error. I just I heard something that I th you know I always make up some excuse when that happens because it's you know it's. It's, it's a faux pas. Um, yeah. And the other thing, too, to think about is you're sitting in a chair. So you're in a situation where you're positioned in a, you're sitting where you're, you know, you're listening to something. So you're acclimated to your position and the sound. And you might be mid-conversation with, with one of the band members about something. And when you get out of the chair and leave the room, then the, the workflow stops. You interrupt the workflow. Right. And there's something really special about, you know, I love those. I, one of my favorite things in the world is when you're in the hot seat and you're in pursuit and there's conversation happening and it's, it's all coming together. And, and there is, um, you know, it's, it's going down exactly. It's being recorded exactly as you hoped or better, you know, sometimes worse. Um, but there is that um, synergy that's happening between the artist and what your vision is and uh, the ergonomics of it all. It's, it's really, that's really a, an amazing thing. Like that moment where you feel like we're all on the same mission together. Yeah. Trying to, trying to score a goal. Yep. And, and you score the goal. You, you score know? the goal. Yeah. Th at least you think you did. <laughs> and the ref later tells you. No goal. No goal. Um, talk to us about your guitars a little bit more. So which which get used the most on a session? Your your Tele, your SG, your Les Paul? I, again, it's it's um, dependent on what I'm going for son sonic-wise. I used to have a ton of guitars. I used to have a ton of them. And over the years, I've whittled, I've whittled everything down to, you know, the hammer, the screwdriver, the chisel, um, the Phillips head, the flathead. Are they necessarily the most expensive top of the line versions of those or are they ones that just do this uh, particular sound the best for you? 
Um, I you mean, whittled your amps down too. I mean, I'm, I don't even yeah. remember if you you loaned me some great amps in the past, like the Bogner. Oh yeah, the Bogner was great. If I think you maybe let that one go. Yeah, I did. Let, I kept the cabinet. Okay, that, that cabinet is unbelievable, and I love the I love that head. My problem with that head is, um, it had to be cranked to get that really special sound that you can get because part of the equation is moving the speakers, you know, pushing that cabinet. And, um, and man, quite frankly, that cabinet is so amazing. But if, the, if my only job at a session was to figure out how that head worked, the options and be able to click through those quickly, that's a, that's a, a job in and of itself. There was right. so much math involved in that. Options on that. Amp. Yeah. There were so many options and man, sometimes you just want to reach over and grab a knob and turn it up. Yeah. And there's one amp that I will never sell. It's a London 65, uh, made by 65 amps. It's uh, one of the original blue ones. It's actually the first year that the company uh, was making these amps. It's 2005, I think, is the year that this amp, I think is the year this amp was made, which is the first year of the company. The company's no longer in existence. But the London is an 18-watt amp. Uh, the right-hand side is uh, like an AC-15. The left-hand side is like a Marshall. And, man... There's no master volume. There's no nonsense. It's only 18 watts. The cabinet has a uh, vintage Celestion 30, and then it has a blue Alnico. So there's two options in one cabinet, as, as well as it being an open back. And, um, man, it just sounds... I mean, you put a mic anywhere near the cabinet, and it sounds incredible. It just is incredible. It's chimey. It can be aggressive. Yeah. Um, you can hear uh, the saturation, like the AC... Uh, side of it and when you turn it all the way up you get this great just british rock sound and it's saturated but you can hear every note in the chord it's the articulation in that amp is just yeah. incredible yeah it's it's interesting to discover those things in in guitar studios falling apart over in the corner there <laughs> rock stars, you're hearing my old studio panels collapse they're trying to take out the the guest right now on the show um you know when you get into distortion, you start really listening in and you realize some distortions, some fuzz pedals will or won't let particular harmonics yeah. and intervals come through, like yeah. thirds in a chord, you know, might might just get squashed. Yeah, it might get some muddy. I've got a I've got a old uh true tone little miniature um tube amp. I think it's actually in my daughter's room right now. And um, if you crank that up and play a power chord through it, you can hear a major third. Oh wow! The chord, and I was always, I thought that was so cool. See, that's the that's the yeah. I mean, this little silver tone you have here is freaking amazing. That one's great. Yeah, I actually got it uh, worked on recently. That's been a thing for me to do too, is to just say, you know what, I'm going to take, unless I just don't care about the instrument or the amp, I'm going to take these ones mm -hmm. and just go instead of coveting buying a new amp. I'm just going to, let me just take this one that is probably pretty good and go have somebody work on it. Yeah. And it's been such a win. Like each one comes back. If you find a good tech, the amps come back. Maybe maybe the guitars, I have to find a new guitar tech now, yeah. but you know, the, the amps come back and they just sound awesome. Yeah. Like never before. I mean, hopefully they still sound awesome when five years later you use it on the session, you know, and you fire it up. Yeah. That sometimes is a challenge with having a bunch of stuff in the studio is like, yeah, you got all these things, you fix them up and then you set it aside. And then when you go to use it, my organ, for example, the Hammond yeah. went to go use it the other day and, and it didn't like, work. The low end hum is back, yeah. you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Cause it's been sitting there and it hasn't been. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's one of the challenges of the, you know, doing the studios like that. Um, what, you, what you mentioned things... this 18 watt amp. So I was going to ask you yeah. about small amps versus big amps in the studio. If you have any thoughts. on Oh that. man, I got to tell you, I'm all about small amps. Um, I don't have, I've got a couple that I love I've, and both of them were gifts actually. Um, you know, every now and then you get, you know, you'll get a, you know, I guess when you're as old as I am or you, you know, as you do this long, so, stuff sometimes gravitates towards the studio, you know, w through good fortune, whether it's someone's generosity or, or you're lucky to find a good deal somewhere, you, you know, uh, and two, the two amps that I'm, I'm talking about right now are, were, very generous gifts on behalf of two friends. So um, one of them, uh, there's a, a friend that I have that I grew up with, was in my band and, and I put together. 
um, in high school or in junior grade school through um, high school. Uh, he's a doctor now, and um, he plays guitar. He's a really talented guy. His name is Mike Hess. And he found this little uh, K amplifier. It's got a little, it's probably a four-inch driver in it, I'm thinking, maybe maybe six-inch. Um, and uh, he found it. It was a given to him. It's in pristine condition until, unfortunately, I was moving around the studio one day and kicked the uh, kicked it and uh, tore this grill cloth. Um, bummer. I know, bummed me out. But this thing sounds incredible incredible it's and it's only a one watt i mean you can we can talk at this volume over top of it it's like the perfect living room amp yeah. if you want to just sit around and noodle yeah. um you know you can clean it up and it's very chimey and then you can open it up all the way and it sounds like jimmy page it's just it is so badass and um so that's that's one amp i've used many times um and then there was a record uh there's an artist named Frankie Ballard and he was doing a record and I was mixing tracks for him. And he called me one day and says, Hey, I got a gift for you. And he comes by and he brings, <laughs> I was like, what? He brings me a 1957 Fender Vibrolux. And it is unbelievable. I mean, it's just, it's, it, you know, it's got the original pedal, which those pedals alone are worth, if you can find them are, you know, really expensive, you know, right. cause they're like these old antique looking on off pedals that were made out of the corner of a fender cabinet. Wow. And, um, but man, it's in a remarkable sounding amp. Um, I love, I, you know, when you're in a pursuit of something, as you know, in, when you're in a hot seat, you got an artist in a room and you're in a pursuit of something. Um, sometimes you have the luxury of going, Hey, let's experiment. And sometimes you don't. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to grab something and go and hope that it's the right vibe. And, um, you know, so the more options you have, the more arrows you have, the better, you know, the better your opportunity is to hit the bullseye. Well, you know, speaking of this idea of does it make sense to have a collection and who uses it and when do you use it on a session? Obviously, I think if it's your, if you're the a guitarist and you got a studio, have a collection because yeah. you want to be playing and it's fun to have yeah. all these sounds. But I, I did find myself having a studio and like having all these cool, funky, different things in there. And then as I would do sessions with clients that were sort of professional leaning clients, I realized like it's like maybe my amps got used, maybe a pedal here and there. Yeah. But but often for the most part, they didn't get used at all because if you're working with a professional, they're showing up with their gear, yeah. you know. And so that was a, just an interesting learning yeah. lesson to remind us that, like, if we want to work with pro clients in our studio, like, our best things to collect might just be the mics and the pre's and stuff yeah. like that. And then it's true, like you said, when I worked with younger artists, then all of a sudden it was fun to, like, pull out, try this guitar, and, you know, my guitar might actually be better than the guitar yeah. they brought. Or, more importantly, the intonation might actually be set. Therein lies the real secret you know you have it's intonated it's you know it's been in a room so it's it's not going to be you're not pulling it out of a case on a cold day and waiting for it to warm up you know that's not you know you know it's going to work you know um and that's that's the that's the real thing what about synths and keyboards do you find that that um that's been helpful to have or do you find that artists you work with they bring in their Nord and they got all the sounds they want kind of thing. You know, that's a really good question. Um, that's probably the one thing in my studio that I have the least of. I've got a controller and a bunch of soft synths that um, you you can work really quickly with. Um, and what I like about that is when you work with MIDI files and you dial in a sound, when you go to mix, if you need to modify the sound, you can go back. You know, right, if, maybe, if maybe the chord voicing is not exactly what you wanted or maybe it's too much for the part or maybe the uh or maybe it's just not the you know maybe there's a flub up or something it allows you to go back and alter that stuff um you know there's i mean there's many projects i just um finished a record with this really cool indie band called hello june and uh um it's uh sarah rudy and uh wit is the uh, bass player drummer and he he had this really killer moog that he bought, that he brought down. And we use that a lot on stuff. 
and he brought down uh, this little tiny keyboard. I can't remember what it was called. Um, that was really cool. Um, we used that stuff a lot for, you know, just textures and, you know, if it normally, you know, if, if it's, if the band wants keyboards, then there's normally a keyboard player in the band. And they're, if they are doing original stuff or working on, you know, if there's something that they've written, then there's a good chance that the keyboard player. Was it the OP1 keyboard, the little white, yes, that's white it. one from yes. Teenage Engineering? That's it. That's the one. I couldn't think of I the just name. Knew it. I had a feeling. Yes, it Very was. Very cool looking keyboard. I have not gotten one of those. They're surprisingly not, they're little, but they are, you know, $1,400 for yeah. a new one or something like that. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very proud of them. Of stuff. <laughs> the people at OP is like, um, it's OP is for our price. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what style of music you create, Native Instruments provides you all the instruments you need. From drums, loops, and beats, to vintage and modern synthesizers, realistic strings, guitar amps, and futuristic synth pads. I really enjoy recording real bands in my studio, but then adding amazing overdubs from Contact, Massive X, Super battery, guitar rig, or hybrid keys. Use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off or get complete start for free today with a bundle of 2,000 sounds and 6 gigs of samples at nativeinstruments.com. I mean, I love all the digital synth stuff. I love, I love all the sound possibilities in the studio, but as a studio person, you know, Again, if we're making our own music, anything goes. Yep. Get it? It's an instrument. Get it. Yep. But if you're making other people's music, you know, you do have to ask yourself these questions. Like, yeah. should I spend money on this thing? Should I spend money over here on this thing? You know? There was a time, there was a time, early, right in the 2000s, early 2000s, where you could get a, um, where you could bill the price of some gear into the recording budget. Right. You know? I mean, those days are so gone. Yeah. But, um should we even mention them? No. <laughs> Should we buy a synth for uh, a white, cool OP1 teen engin engineering synth, or should we get, like, the most badass automatic espresso machine for the studio? Oh, see, I Which would go— Which one will the clients yeah. come to you for? <laughs> well, that's a good point. Um, I would have a uh, an OP synth that makes espresso— is what I would hope for. Oh, so I went to the um, Consumer Electronics show this year in Vegas, and right next to where I was uh, kind of hanging out was a robotic barista booth. Oh, wow! Where you could, and it was just this thing you could buy it if you wanted. If you had the money and wanted to spend, you know, like fifty to seventy k, you could you could buy an all in one kiosk with a robot arm and all the coffee making, you know, implements. And stick it in a mall somewhere, and you know, and hire somebody to to monitor the thing and just make sure the powers, you know, the the cords plugged into the wall, <laughs> and this thing will like take your orders and make your coffee. Holy for you. cow! So uh, that'd be pretty cool in the would, studio, right? That'd be pretty cool, except for you know, spending. I just think about what budgets are are like now, and and <laughs> you know, just how small they are. It's just you know. Um, and, and an expense like that would be definitely something. If you that, had 70K right now, what would you spend it on for your studio? What's well, the first thing that comes to mind? I would spend it on a Roth IRA. <laughs> <laughs> Good no, I would, uh, if I had 70 grand. They won't to, let you put that much in in a year. Sorry. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I'd have to diverse, figure out some way to diversify. But um, no, if I, if, if I had 70 grand to spend, I think I would spend, I think I would, uh, just buy a bunch of really interesting mics. Um, I, I'm a little, uh, it's funny. I'll like during the pandemic, especially the gear prices went way up. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that? It was really crazy. Yeah. Cause everybody was buying, everyone was stuff buying for gear. Studios, yeah. and there were supply chain issues and, and yeah. stuff. So, yeah. um, it's, it, there's a thing on reverb, you know, if you buy a piece of gear on reverb, you can, there's a little, uh, thing that lets you tag your purchase. Uh, and keep track of the purchases that you, purchases that you have made, and you can go back and visit that page, visit that link in Reverb, and it will tell you if your gear has appreciated or declined in value. Um, and it's it's like watching stocks, you know. Every piece of gear I get, I try to 
buy something that I know is going to either retain its value or uh, go up in value. Really, even that headphone extension cable? Even I, even, <laughs> even the Mogami artisanal free range headphone extension artisanal. cable. Artisanal. <laughs> so yes, um, no, yeah. I mean, there's obviously stuff you're going to piss away money on. Cabling is, you know, having a studio is not cheap. It's, I only buy free range plugins. <laughs> Free, organic free full range plugins. Yeah, free full range plugins um okay cool man well i'm i'm right now i'm staring at a synthesizer on my computer screen here so let me switch over to this um i've been getting excited about guitars again i'm playing more so i started hunting around for a telly thinking like oh what can i find you know i went go play telecasters for two hours straight at Sam Ash, and I was like, boy, I love this place. There's nobody here. It's just me. I can turn up the Sam. But one of the things that I started wondering about was, you know, there are companies, you know, some some of these brands make guitars, like the cheaper model is pretty good physically, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you can consider getting a cheaper one and then just like begin upgrading the components on it, like swap out the pickups, swap I'm out the I'm in the process of doing that like now. That. Talk about that because I bet you got experience in that. Have you found that that can be an effective way to level up your guitar quality in your studio? Well, here's the thing is about guitars. Um, guitars are uniquely personal. We're attracted to them uh, by their shape, their color, um, by our favorite player maybe playing one. Um, there's things that draw us to a guitar, but they all sound different. And you can have a you can spend a lot of money on a really nice guitar and it sound like shit. Mm -hmm. um, it's just one of those possibilities. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a couple of instruments that I've bought recently that have um, I bought out of boredom. Um, I bought a Dan Electro baritone. Now I had a baritone. Um, Such a Nashville purchase. Too. Oh, let me tell you something, man. It's funny you drop a, the tuning a fourth and play cowboy chords on it. It's a whole different ball game. They put the tremolo on. You got to put the tremolo oh, on, right? Just, wah, wah, yeah. wah, 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 wah. Man, it's so exciting. It's I as soon as I got that Dano, I I don't know how many songs I wrote just on the Dano. I mean, just just because I was so inspired by, um, you know, it's funny when you when you sit down at a piano and you play a D, um, let's say or let's say a you know a D C minor, note. saddest of all keys, well, a D minor, the saddest. If you play a if you play a C note and then right beside it play the D right beside it. If you got a C note, get leave the studio, close up shop, and go have some fun for the rest of the night. Go, go get a beer. <laughs> go get a beer. Sorry, go but ahead. no. If you play those two notes side by side, uh, it's dissident, right. you know. Uh, but if you play the C and then you went down an octave and played the D, it's pleasing, right? Right, because it's got enough space between them. Enough right? space between them and stuff. Um, and it's, it's, so the way that we hear those things affects how we use them. And it's the same with a baritone. The baritone, you know, is tuned down a fourth. So when you go through these, uh, when you go through some of your fundamental chords, they just ring differently. And if you're a singer, for example, and you're used to maybe singing uh, just at the top of your range, um, with a with a baritone guitar, you can drop your range by a fourth and have more room to express yourself. So it's a very right, inspiring actually, instrument to play. You're, you're by dropping the guitar tuning down a little bit, you're just kind of moving the voicing of the guitar chords uh, down lower out of the register of your lead vocal. Right. Too. And it allows you to, if you know, if you're, you know, if you have a limited um, range and your melodies always kind of tend to go between, you know, a certain amount of notes that drop in the fourth opens that range up and allows you to to hear things differently. Right. Now you can be the crash test dummies. Oh, man. I forgot do, about do, that do, guy. Do the only quote I know, she had birthmarks all over her body. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only God, I forgot about that guy, I man. Yeah. Where's he now? Da, 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 da. Would you like fries with that order? There you go. Um, um, yeah, no, that stuff's fun. And it's, you know, Again, the process of learning about voicings and production and so much stuff that makes a record sound better has nothing to do with spending any money at all. Don't. Like, you know, it's like, you know, uh, it's great to get a fancy mic, but just make putting the right sound in front of a chief mic is going to make a lot more difference. Oh, yeah. um, it's great to get plugins that do incredible mixing stunts. 
but just arranging your song well is yeah. going to take you a lot further. Yeah. You know, I, um, I was way more creative when I had less options. Um, and I think that anyone out there in recording world, um, if you're accumulating gear and plugins and all this other bullshit, um, it's not going to improve your writing. It's not going to improve the song you write. It's not going to improve anything. It's going to give you options and colors and things to work with and maybe sound different. But at the end of the day, you know, if you're sitting there with option overload, you're thinking about things that are not based on the song and what the important stuff is. Obviously, there's a shift you make. You know, you write a song, you record a song. Um, so there, you know, there is that transition. But I really do feel like it's easy. Option overload sometimes can kill the creativity. Absolutely. I, I, I as a just to be devil's advocate, I will say when you buy those plugins, it does improve your mode mood for a moment. When you buy it, does. It. you're like that was fun, cool. I can't wait to check that out. But I will also suggest that um, it is fun to get plugins that are part of our engineering um, palette of colors yeah. that are things we use in the mix because we'll try them out and stuff like that. But I guess this is similar, really. Um, when I'm actually mixing, I am i don't really need 10 different compressors all at once. I kind of need the couple few that I'm likely to use mm -hmm. on that mix. Um, you know, occasionally you go and you you dig deeper with a particular sound and you might add some new colors in there. But it is fun to have those ones and decide like, you know, for this one, I'm using, you know, my, my 1176 plugins. And for this one, I'm using my, my distressor plugins yeah. um, or my SSL. I use the SSL one a lot now that I've got the controllers. Those are great. Yeah. But, but when I think about it in context of instruments, I would say you, you 100% have permission to, to get any new instrument you want because every time you have the new instrument it inspires you a little bit to make a song. If you don't give yourself the moment to play with it and get yeah. inspired with it, then you're wasting your time potentially. Yeah. The other two instruments that I bought um, in the last eight months or so um, was, well, one was the baritone and then the other two were, um, there's a guy here in town that makes rubber bridge guitars. So oh, yeah, he, you're telling me about that. Keep going. So he What's takes, a rubber bridge guitar? So he takes these old, like, Stellas and Silvertones, these short-scale acoustics, normally cheap guitars made in the late 60s or, you know, late 50s through the 60s, early 70s. So the early 70s, they started kind of phasing them out a little bit. Normally, they're like silver tones, you see, and that kind of thing. And uh, they've got a little trapeze tailpiece and stuff. And what this guy does is he takes the top off of them, he redoes the bracing, and then he puts a, a hot rails single co or a double coil hot rails pickup, and the one that I have it's it's wired direct to the output. There's no volume or knob or anything. Um, and then he puts a rubber bridge on it, and then he puts flat wound strings on it, and it is a very cool vibe. Um, so it's a string. It's a note that doesn't have lots of sustain, but it's got it's got some boing to it or something. Yeah, it's very it's very plucky sounding. Um, I got this one because I was doing a single on a band from the Cayman Islands. And they had written a song. It was written on a ukulele. And I said, There's, I'm not cutting a ukulele. I'm, <laughs> no, you're cut. You mean you are cutting the ukulele? Right? I, I, We're I, cutting that shit out of this record. Yeah, it's like, saying? hey, you know, I just, that's my own little uh, quirk. I, I, there's some things that are so obvious in a track that I'm just like, if that's the obvious answer, then I'm going to go the opposite direction. So, but I, the you sound. You didn't want nice people from around the world to just love this new, new song you were doing. <laughs> I just was like, I just wasn't going to do it, man. I just was not, I was just resistant to the fact. Don't want it to be on their default friendly playlist. No, no. But I found, what I did find is I took this rubber bridge guitar and I used it <laughs> And I played the chord voicings guitar wise on, and it sounded like ukulele, but it sounded like a baritone ukulele. So it was, it was a, it was easier to kind of do the voicings that I was searching for because as a guitar player, I wasn't going to sit there and try to figure out. No way, I'm going to sit there and try to figure out how to play a damn ukulele. It was as we're sitting on the clock. All dogs have fleas. <laughs>
My dog has fleas. And it Where were up. you? <laughs> that doesn't help me play it, though. No, but it, it did the job and it worked great. And it was just enough of a difference that it was like, oh, okay, this sounds like a ukulele, but it's not. It's more, the voicings are, are a little richer, a little more complex. Um, and it worked perfect. And, um, and then the other, the last one I bought was Fender teamed up with Luge, L O O G. Oh, uh, the makers of the bobsled? <laughs> The Jamaican Luge. Sorry, that's the L-U-G-E. This is they, what they do is they make these little children's guitars, these little three-string guitars. And I think my brother's got those in his music uh, school in Brooklyn. Man, they're the best. It is. It's Fender made a little three-string Strat. It's a tiny little thing. The neck is like the neck is so small, and you can tune it however the hell you want to tune it. So I'd tune it to a chord, and then just play. And it is so fun to play. So for literally for a month and a half, two months, all I did was use the Dano and the Luge to write with. I was so inspired. So I would start with the Dano on a track, and then I would add the Luge on top of it because of the uh, the tonal difference of the range and stuff. So you start with the Dano and then Luge it up? I'd Luge it up, Luge it around a little bit. Adam Audio is celebrating 25 years of researching, developing, and manufacturing industry-leading monitoring solutions in Berlin. To mark this milestone, our friends at Adam Audio are unveiling a special limited edition series of monitors that will look stunning in your studio and sound as awesome as your music. Introducing the Arctic White A4V and A7V series. Available for a limited time to pro and home studio owners like yourself, the clean, glossy white finish exudes a luxurious feel and will stand out in any studio or home audio system. Featuring the XART accelerated ribbon tweeter design and customizable speaker voicings, the Arctic White A4V and A7V retain the full specifications of the original design. Plus, with Sonarworks integration for automated room correction, you can fine-tune your monitors to your control room's acoustics. Adam Audio's commitment to delivering professional-grade, high-fidelity sound to studios worldwide has made these monitors a perfect fit for Grammy-winning producers in both pro and home studios for a quarter of a century. Now you can bring that beautiful, high-fidelity sound to your own productions and make your studio look as cool as your music sounds. Don't miss out on the limited edition Arctic White A4V and A7V monitors. Available for a short time with the standard extended five-year warranty at adamaudio.com. I am really impressed with Isotope Ozone. I've been mastering many of my records recently, and Ozone makes it so easy to get a fantastic sound. The built-in mastering assistant helps by analyzing the mix and suggesting all the settings needed for a professionally mastered result based on the genre and EQ curve of your choice. You can even reference a specific song if you want using simple yet sophisticated modules like Clarity, Impact, Low End Focus, Stabilizer, Imager, Exciter, and Spectral Shaping, along with powerful dynamic EQ, compression, and limiting, you just adjust the settings to your taste and it sounds incredible. And the magic of mastery balance means you can manipulate the level of the vocal, bass, and drums even at the mastering stage. Amazing. My bandmates are pretty demanding, but now when I send off the masters for approval, they absolutely love the way our records sound thanks to Isotope. Use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off Ozone or other tools like RX and Voice Enhancement Assistant or grab any of the cool free plugs like the new trash light at isotope.com. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session, a.k.a. the second half of the show here at Podzilla Studios. <laughs> and my guest today is Roger Podzilla. Allen Nichols joining us <laughs> once again at Pod, damn it, Potty Mouth P -pod. Productions. Peapod. Peapod Productions. <laughs> You ready to jam, dude? I'm ready. All right. Ready. So, uh, shit, what were we just joking about? We, we, were, saying, we were talking about Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I've got so much gear oh, yeah. and stuff. When I Sometimes I look around the studio and I think, 
I mean, I'm not going to stop getting stuff because it's really fun to get yeah. stuff. But truthfully, it's like what I really need to do is just get time, like give myself some time to use it. And you, you started to comment on that. No, well, it's, it's a, it is a rabbit hole. There is a, um, I've never actually seen the rabbit though. So it must be a deep hole. Oh, it's a deep one. <laughs> it is. Uh, I mean, I just think about when I transitioned into uh, producing and all that stuff years and years and years ago. And it was like, you know, I didn't write for a long time because I was, I didn't have the time to, I was, I was consumed with ingesting information and working on stuff and, you know, um, you're, it's, it just feels like you're spending all of your time trying to figure it out and not create. You're creating, but it's not, it's, it's a different mindset. Right. You know, it's a different mindset. I had this band in town this last weekend and um, a really cool band out of Kansas City. And uh, we wrote a couple of songs and demoed them. And it was really interesting because uh, they, when we were started to work on the idea, the ideas, you know, they brought a couple of ideas and we cherry picked a couple of them and, and wrote those. As we started the process, uh, we were spitting lyrics just and just you know, getting into the groove of it and writing the lyric and it would happen really quickly. And I can remember even up to a couple of years ago where that was difficult for me because I was so, my, the way I thought about stuff was so divided into uh, regions, you know? Um, and it's only really been in, within the last year that that has been, uh, that's, you know, the, the free flow of that has come back. Yeah. So, what do you, talk a little bit about that? So, do you think of yourself as a lyricist? Were you a lyricist in dreaming in English? And yep. Um, I I. What were some ways that you used to write lyrics, and you know, versus ways that you write lyrics today? Well, so here's one of the unique benefits of um, having a studio and needing to generate an income. Uh, when I first opened, when I fir when I moved out of the house with a studio and got the commercial space, you moved out of the house. I did. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> when I moved out of the house um, into a commercial space, my overhead tripled. Right. So you know you you got to bring there's work some work that you would have to take on that you necessarily wouldn't pursue, but you're welcome. You're glad you welcome it as it comes through the door. And one of the things that I did for a long time was uh, cut demos for songwriters and cut demos and mix demos for uh, publishing companies. Right. So you're hearing, you know, every day I would be hearing, um, you know, Hall of Fame writers, uh, writers with number ones, all this stuff, you know, I would hear you know, what they were doing lyrically and focus on that. And, um, you know, sometimes I'd be, man, I've, man, I've been, been really fortunate to sit in a room with Hall of Fame writers as they debate whether a song, whether it's the word and, whether it should be and or should it be the, you know what I mean? They're like the detail in which that stuff is, is scoped. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's, look, it's, that kind of writing is, uh, that kind of writing, I think, follows uh, the line of work when you're pitching songs to artists because you've got to write a song that's bulletproof. And what makes a song bulletproof is the lyric, is is the, what it is you're trying to say, along with uh, the vibe of the track and all that other. There's a lot of uh, crap like that that kind of plays into it. But, you know, for years, being able to to be exposed to that kind of stuff has influenced on how I look at lyrics now. Um, I, when I was in Dreaming in English, um, we had a singer and the singer, uh, you know, there were certain vowel sounds that he didn't like to sing. And, you know, there were certain, I knew him well enough to know that, okay, if we're putting this lyric together, if we're crafting this lyric, there's certain words we're not going to use. Um, like she, like you she, never put that in a song. Well, heart was one of them. Heart. Like he, he, heart. he, he did not like the word heart. And, um, so, and plus, you know, plus 
when you're writing with someone, like when I'm writing with someone, I'm very conscious of the fact that, um, like this last weekend, I was writing the two, the, the musicians that I was writing with were female and, uh, they're out of Kansas city. And, um, you know, I'm considerably older and male. So when I would present ideas to them, I had to make sure that I just presented enough to kind of get the idea rolling and then pay close attention to how they wanted to have it framed because they were coming from a completely different perspective than I was. And they're the ones that have to sing it. So there are certain hills that you die on and certain ones you don't die on. Um, the one you never, the one I will never die on is the perspective that the artist wants to uh, represent. The, you know, it's, you got to pay attention to it. If you want the artist to cut the song, you can't just go, here's the song, sing it this way. Unless, you know, unless that's what you are, unless you're that kind of talent. Uh, there are, and there are a lot of artists out there that are just singers that are not, you know, writers. So the, there's, you know, am I a lyricist? Yes, I am a lyricist. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty ferocious about some things. Do you write lyrics starting with yourself or do you find that you mostly would be jumping into write lyrics with somebody else who's already got an idea started. Yeah, well, it's and, funny. And I, you're, so like you're helping craft the lyrics. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, I, I've i got notes of, like I'll have song ideas. I've got so many song ideas and little hooks and, and little parts that I know that I can pull from if I need it. Um, but I don't sit down and write stuff. I don't, right. I mean, there's no, there's no purpose. I'm not going to go out and sing it. I'm not going to, you know, um, so I'm not going to complete a thought. Right. But what I do do when I sit down with an artist is pay very close attention to, there are things that you got to pay attention to when you're writing a song. Right. And we've talked about these, I think, on the other, some of the other podcasts that you and I have done together. All 50 of them. Um, all 55 of them, yeah. The prosody, there's, there's, you know, the vibe of the song. There's one song that we, um, we were writing this weekend where um, the artist was like, yeah, this feels, when we, when we came up with this riff and this idea, we were in this location, and this is kind of how the the location influenced the uh, the riff. And the, the they were out in the desert, and they were doing this trip, and um, so we talked about that. And then all of a sudden, it was just like, okay, well, here it comes, boom, 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 boom. You know, you start to think about the vibe of it and stuff, and then the story comes into focus. And with that, you know, comes the lyrics. You know, so you're like. I don't know if you should rhyme. I got a pee with Joshua Tree, but if that's what you guys were feeling on that trip, <laughs> my, my work. Um, your wife also is responsible for a magnificent place here called the Bluebird, yeah. which is home to many, many of the greatest writers. Um, and you know, people will go and perform there. So, do you feel like you've you've been exposed to? I mean, you talked about doing demos with writers. Has that been a pretty amazing experience to just be exposed to all these top writers? Oh yeah, in Nashville, and even seeing them at the show. Yeah, and and that shows at the Bluebird. Yes, it is. Every you know, every now and then, about you know, probably two or three times a month, Erica will call me and say, "There's a show tonight. You need to come and see." And it, that's how the conversation will start. And I'll say, oh, "I'm tired. I've been sitting in front of." Me. And she'll, she'll go, "You need to come and see this." When she says that to me, I know that it's something that I need. To, and it never fails. I'll go see a show and I'll, I might kick and scream all the way there, but I will sit there and go, holy shit, you know, and walk away inspired and uh, curious. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of people, and we're talking about, we're, we're sitting in Nashville and we're talking about stuff. And I know out there in, um, in the rock star recording world, I, there's a majority of, of people that will probably will listen to this and go, oh, they're talking about country songs. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a great song. And a great song is not a country song or a rock song. A great song is a song that conveys uh, a message, a point, a feeling, and, um, and does it in a way that makes you want to listen to it again. Um, it, it doesn't mean you wear a cowboy hat or, you know, wear Wrangler jeans and drive a four by four. It's just, 
you know, it, it, a great song. I, and that's, that's part of the hump that I had to get over when I first moved to town. Oh, well, I play rock. I don't listen to country, you know? And I was a pretty opinionated about that stuff. Um, and it wasn't until I really started, uh, getting out of the way of my own, um, opinion and, well, you'd be a little bit more protective of it back in, you know, late yes. '80s into the '90s. I mean, I guess '80s. I wasn't here yet, but that was the the chapter of Jason and the Scorchers. Yep, just beginning to break all those rules too. Yeah, and even if you went before that, I mean, yeah, I feel like the early '70s country was already doing some cool rule bending. Yeah, it was funny because when I came to town and Jason and the Scorchers and there's Royal Court of China, there was all these, you know, really. Uh, cool bands. Some of them, like Jason and Scorchers, I didn't really appreciate. It took me a while to, because I always thought it was just country. You know? Yeah. I remember, um, I remember. But apparently it was pretty wild, unbridled country, right? It, it was. It, you know, I, look, I was, I was young and had an, uh, an opinion that wasn't necessarily educated. Um, was, was very narrow, narrow-minded. Um, so, I had to learn to embrace, uh, I had to learn to be curious. I think, you know, any, at any point, whether you're an engineer, producer, a musician, a songwriter, at the point that you stop being curious, at the point that you stop um, asking questions, I think that's the point when you're done. Because... And it, and look, if 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 you get to that point as a writer, you go, you know what, screw this, I'm not, you know, that that's fine. There's no right or wrong answer to that. It's just, but I feel like as people, as artists, I feel like the 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 number one thing that we have to do is remain curious because if you don't, you're not going to uh, stuff's going to sneak up on you. You're going to you're going to end up standing on the shoreline watching the boat sail away, and. Um, you know, unless you're retired and don't give a shit, I think that that's a horrible feeling. You know, I, I spend every, Friday mornings are pretty religious for me at the studio. I'll, I'll sit down on Spotify and listen to new releases and I play the game where it's like, I'll click on it. I'll listen to the verse and the chorus. If it's good, I'll keep listening. How do you find new releases on Spotify? Well, there's, there's tons of playlists, you know, where they have new releases. Yeah, but and, sometimes that's a problem because I listen, I'm like, this is just terrible. Yeah. You know? Well, therein lies the problem with, with, the way music is created now. It's like I said before, and one other time when we were talking, you know, um, you, there's no special ticket needed now to get, to make music. And that's a beautiful thing. Really beautiful thing. Everybody's chocolate bar has got a golden ticket in it. Everyone, everyone, you know, <laughs> it's, and, and Charlie and the chocolate factory has now been remade again. <laughs> That's exactly what it is, you know. I mean, it, it's you know, if everyone carried handguns, then more people you know are going to be. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to even get into that because you'll probably get a shit ton of, you know, emails about you know. You know well, it's uh, one of the things I love about making records and and this podcast in particular too is that there's all kinds of folks out there making records on all kinds of all sides of political issues and all that kind of stuff. So. It's an it's a interesting and vast spectrum, but we all come together and focus when it comes to the studio. You know, making getting things to record well, sound great, all that. It's just definitely a shared interest. It uh, you know, it's a there's an opportunity every time you sit down to work with an artist. There's an opportunity to learn something, to grow, to affect that person, that artist, in a positive way. Um, through encouragement, through pushing, there's, there's an amazing opportunity. And if you do it right, you create an environment where the artist feels safe and feels encouraged and pushed in a good way. Um, everyone wins. Budgets are shrinking. Uh, opportunities are fleeting. I, so this last year, I'll tell a quick story. Uh, this last year, uh, I got a call from these two managers that I know here in town. And uh, they represent this artist named Tracy Nelson. And Tracy is a legacy blues singer. Uh, when I say legacy, she's kissing 80. 
she's she moved to Nashville in 69, 70. Um, our first Grammy nomination was in 1973 with Willie Nelson, a duet she did with Willie Nelson. No, Tracy Nelson, Willie Nelson, no association. She, um, anyways, these guys managed her. And she had signed uh, with BMG for a one-album deal. I think it might go to two now. But um, So she hadn't done a record in 10 years. And she had this producer who is a well-known producer in the blues community. And my understanding was BMG had this much money to make the record. That is it. And I'm not going to say the number, but it is not impressive. John Mayall was producing a record. That's cool. John May, yeah, he, he flew to Nashville. He was, he was ready to go. Just kidding. He, um, so they came to me and they said, "Look, every time we, every time we get a budget from this producer, it's ten grand over, or it's fifteen grand over. Um, could you do the record for this much money?" Now, common sense would say, "Nope, can't do it for that much money." Not only can I do it for that much money, I'm not that kind you know, we're talking about a genre of music that I don't particularly, uh, I don't spend the majority of my time dealing with, you know? But I said, yes. I said, sure. Um, and we started this process. And it was, the deal I made with him was, and this is, you know, don't, uh, don't use this as a uh, as a measuring stick in any scenario. But I thought you were going to say, "Don't don't repeat this to anybody, rock stars." <laughs> don't repeat this, rock stars. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I didn't do a contract. It was a major label release, and I said, "Well, if the budget is only this, I am not going to spend a portion of that on an attorney. So right. I'm going to shake your hand, and I'll deliver the record." On under budget. I'll, I'll shake you. your hand and your hand better have the full budget in it when we shake. <laughs> well, I delivered the record $59 under budget. And um in honor of the 59 Telecaster. 59 Les Paul. 59 Les Paul. Yeah. Sorry. Duh. So we delivered delivered the record and it was really fascinating experience. 59 gold top. Come on, gold. man. No 57 gold top. Oh shit. By 59, we were into the sunburst phase. Okay. But it got nominated this year for a Grammy. So it was like out of the blue. It was like, you know, it was nominated as album of the year uh, in the traditional blues category. Didn't see that coming. That wasn't in my bingo cards. Yeah. All I did, all I did is cared about the project. And if I had sat down to work on a, as a matter of fact, the producer or the manager, one of the managers said to me after a couple of days of pre-production, we were working on, you know, putting the songs together and stuff. The manager made a comment to me like, I hope you're ready to go to the Grammys, you know? And I told him to shut the fuck up. I said, I don't want to hear that. I don't ever, don't ever bring that up again. That's not why we're doing this. And I feel like uh, there, you know, because it's the music business, because, you know, we all have aspirations and we all have this expectation and stuff. I feel like it's easy to do things for the wrong reason. You know, it's, I saw an opportunity to work with an artist that I have heard about um, in a genre of music I wasn't particularly comfortable in or, or uh, uh, well-versed. I mean, I know the blues and I, I got a history of dealing with blues players and, you know. Have you had the blues? I've had the blues, trust me. <laughs> I had the blues halfway through this record. Um, oh, I thought you said this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> God. But it was, you know, it was, we started this journey and the part of the deal that I made with them is I shook their hand. I said, no, no signed agreement. I'll just give you my word. I'll do the record for the budget. And I'll, I said, but I have got to be able to work on other projects and intertwine them because this rec this project will, you know, we're not going to be able to get it done for the budget in a short time. We're gonna to have to drag this out. And it was a really fascinating experience because we did a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, it has Charlie Musselwhite on it. We had Willie Nelson on it. We had um, John Tavius Willis, who was one of the most amazing blues artists, um, young blues. I mean, he just, he's, he's the real deal blues artist. 
Uh, we had um, uh, Irma Thomas. We had Marsha Ball. We had all these people guesting on the record. So there was a lot of um, there's a lot of remote recording. Uh, yeah, so it was it was it was a bit of a logistical challenge. Uh, it was definitely a budgetary challenge, um, and along the way, uh, I developed a really great relationship with a great artist who initially didn't know who the hell I was and didn't trust me, and she made it very clear that that was the case. And at this point, with the Grammy nomination, that was the one, mm -hmm. and all that all that positive stuff, you, you're starting to get a good feeling that they're likely to pay the invoice pretty soon. <laughs> man, I tell you, that money is so far gone. <laughs> Holy cow, man. That money is so far gone. So it's, you know, it, you got to remain curious. You know, if you, if, if you, if you're comfortable with these four, if you're comfortable with four chords and all you do is recreate those four chords, you know, you're probably, it's probably going to be a little slower growth process than it would be if you, said, oh, I'm going to try some things. I'm going to throw some diminished chords in here and a couple of minor chords and maybe some ninths and some sp suspensions that are cool, you know. And that stuff you did into a blues record too? Man, I'll tell you what, there was, we had some amazing players that um, that just, it was, it was incredible, you know. Um, some incredible musicians. Right on. Well, it's always cool to hear stories about Stuff like that, especially, you know, the success stories and getting a chance to go. So did you go to the Grammys? Didn't for, go this year. No. Didn't go this year. There okay. was, um, there were two records I worked on that were nominated this year. There was the Tracy Nelson one, which was nominated in traditional blues that I produced. I did some engineering on it and mixed it. Uh, we tracked it at Sound Emporium, the tracking engineer. Right. Um, you, I still haven't worked over there. I've oh, been there, but I haven't worked over man, there. Man, the yet. B room is incredible. Um, I hear so many great records coming out of there and so many great stories. Mike Stankiewicz was the uh, tracking engineer. Brilliant. Right. And I think you were connecting me with Mike, and Mike, we're overdue to have you on the podcast. Mike, is he's brilliant. And Grant, who was the assistant on those sessions, were brilliant. We went to Sound Emporium because, um, you know, when you produce a project, you're responsible for the budget. And there's a lot of things you got to take into consideration. The thing that we did with this record is I was I was not going to build this record one track at a time with a lot of overdubs. We knew that we were going to have to do some remote recording. We knew that we were going to have to sub some stuff out. So it was important for me to make sure that we had we the the foundation in which we photographed the songs were of the band playing in a room together. So we went, you know, uh, we used some players. Um, you know, we used a bunch of players that have been around for a, for a while and have played on some great records. And I wanted to make sure they were comfortable. They had access to CNN or Fox or whatever they wanted to watch and access to, you know, a coffee machine and access to bathroom. You know, I just wanted to make sure they were comfortable. Yeah. And in my environment, in my studio, it's it's a little more like you're building a, um, you're, you're in a fort or, you know, a tree house. So, um, so we opted, I opted to spend a portion of the budget on the tracking of it, knowing that that was going to save us money in the long term and that there would be an authentic performance and we would get the best out of it. It was, you know, everything was tracked through an API. Um, and there is definitely a difference in the recording process when you track through a console with, um, with multiple or with, uh, multiple tracks, the color that a console gives a recording over top of multiple different pre's is pretty astonishing. What do songwriters, music producers, DJs, EDM artists, TV and film composers all have in common with you and me? We all need amazing sounds that instantly elevate our music to the desired style. That's why Native Instruments is your ultimate toolkit, offering a massive library of sounds for your studio. Whether you're into hip hop, indie pop, classic rock, meditation music, dance beats, or orchestral arrangements, the Native Instruments Complete Bundle has it all. 
From drums, loops, and beats, to synths, realistic strings, vintage bass, guitars, and keys, it's a comprehensive collection. I love recording real bands in my studio, but then enhancing the tracks with drum samples, synths, and futuristic keys from battery, contact, massive X, guitar rig, and hybrid keys, for example. It's a surefire way to make your productions sound modern and unique. Use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off or get complete start for free today, featuring 2,000 sounds and 6 gigs of samples at nativeinstruments.com. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So I don't have a console that I'm using regularly in the studio, although I do have the the big six from SSL, which is great. But I have a lot of the Spectra 1964 yeah. STX mic prees. And I've noticed that I still get that same kind of console feeling, like the stuff I was playing for yeah. you that feels like a band playing in the room. There's a quality to it about it playing together in a space through the same mic prees that still gives it that kind of console yeah. vibe to me, which yeah. is pretty hip. You know? What I love about prees, my studio is all pre-based. And what I love about it is, you know, I've got certain prees that I use on certain things. And I bought those prees for that reason. And, you know, they're not all the same. And they're not all the same for a reason, you know. Um, but I, you know, I am, I have figured out how to kind of gel all that stuff together, you know. And, and it's about, you know, it's more performance based than it is, but I can definitely hear like the, when we got, when I got back to the studio and started listening to these tracks, I was going, Oh man, it's something about cutting through a console. <laughs> There's definitely a difference. It's just to me, consoles at this point are, um, are, are, are less meaningful in the way we're making music now. Let's talk about choosing mic pre's for your studio. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you find useful in a mic pre right now in the studio? Like you're in a studio situation where you maybe get one or two of a particular mic pre so that you can record or overdub with it. Um, what are the elements of a mic pre choice that you think can be helpful to the rock stars if they're trying to figure out what should I get? Well, each, you know, each pre has a different color. Each, you know, I always think of a Neve as like driving a big Cadillac and you, you know, you turn the wheel and it's slow to move, but it's like, it's just so fun to ride. And, you know, it's fat and it hugs the road. You can hear the cloud. <laughs> it's like, man, it's like this thing, you know? Um, and I, I think of an APA, API as like driving a BMW. It's a little, little, a little quicker, a little, a little snappier. Tighter. Yeah. Tighter uh, steering suspension. Yes. It's, it just has this thing about it, you know. Um, and then I've got some some pre's that are like, I've got some Great River stuff, which are Neve knocks off, and I've got a Phoenix Audio thing. I've got pieces of gear that are that are close to those two food groups, Neve and API. And then I have the Telefunkens uh, for vocals, which are always just, you know, Every time I'll steer away, maybe use a 1073 on a vocal, which sounds incredible. But when I go back to the V72, you just go, oh, wow. You know, it's, it's just has this thing. Yeah. What about um, EQ? How, how useful do you find EQ in the rack, in the outboard gear, in a studio situation? Would you advise people to go spend extra money on that or would you be more inclined to advise the rock stars to just pick up two more mic pre's and add it to their collection. I would suggest if you have money to spend on an EQ or money to spend on a pre, you're going to get more use out of the pre. Here's the problem. And here's the reason why I say, um, when I first started recording, I leaned heavily on EQs for stuff. Right. Um, Me too, I think. The problem is, is you don't know where it's going to end up. And you can you can damage the source material if you overcompensate for what the room gives you. Um, every time you move, when you're sitting in front of speakers, every time you move your head, you're re-EQing mm -hmm. something. And so it's hard to make a decision based upon... If you're building a track, you know, it's like, and you start with an acoustic guitar and it's like, oh man, that acoustic, I want to make it brighter, you know? Um, but then you start piling other stuff on and making it brighter. The longer you're working, the longer you're sitting in front of the speakers, the more uh, brighter you're going to make things because your ears start to be desensitized. Um, I always feel like 
it, I always feel like it's safest to um, just to get the sound in at a great level with a cool color and then use, use positioning on the mics um, to brighten it up or to, to kind of get things, you know, don't make the EQ choices without knowing what the photograph's going to be. Right. And when you were talking earlier about multi-miking the guitar cab and then blending it together through the line mixer, in that situation, you're getting the EQ quality that gives the guitar a tone that seems to fit better, but you're also keeping all of that phase coherent. You're not messing with the phase of the guitar like an EQ does yes. as well, right? That's right. Yeah, it's really, man, it's really... I mean, assuming the, the mics are in phase with each other, yeah. too. Yeah. Now, what I will do on occasion... Like I have one pre, it's Electric and Company. It's their version of what a uh, an Ampex 351 is. And it's a beautiful sounding pre. When you start it up, does it go, hey, you guys? <laughs> like Electric and Company. Yeah, like Electric Company, yeah. right? Didn't, yeah, that how they God, the I haven't done? thought about that in years. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Um, it's a tube pre. It's got some big ass transformers on it. It's probably... The electric and company gear, it comes out of Austin, Texas. It's probably, man, it is it is made the way gear should be made. It is incredible, man. Every knob, every switch, everything is just when you when you turn it, it's like, man, it is like it just you can tell it's built to last. It is incredible. And um, so I'll use that. Like I use that all I use that. Like when I get a vocal into Pro Tools and I'm mixing, if I want some saturation on a vocal, I'll run it back out of Pro Tools through the electric and company based, right. based upon and then find a saturation that works in context of the track as opposed to printing it with saturation and then hoping I didn't overstep the boundaries. So let me follow that with the question of saturation, outboard or plug-in? I, both. I mean, I've used them both. I mean, I've used a decapitator a hundred thousand times. It, use this little radiator plug-in uh, that UA makes, which is like an Altec piece of gear. Yeah. I use that quite a bit on stuff. Um, when you say stuff, are you thinking vocal? Are you thinking drums? Are you thinking all of it? Yeah. Bass, on, 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 it, it just depends on what the source is and what it needs. You know, I've I've gotten tracks before where the vocal's been really bright, really sibilant. And what I'll do if if I want to work quickly, um, like I'll run it, you know, through, you know, um eleven seventy six or something, but maybe before I hit the eleven seventy six, I might run it through the radiator plug in and then roll all the treble off. And there's treble and bass is what the two knobs are on mm -hmm. the radiator. I'll darken it completely and then I'll compress it. And then I'll put a pole tech on the back side of that. And what I'll do is I will use the attenuator, set it at about 10K and roll the 10K off and then put the boost at 8K and then widen the cue and boost that. So basically what I'll do is I'll rebuild the top end of it. And that has that will tame the sibilance. Right. It's like a pre-emphasis, post-emphasis, like a tape yes. machine. Yeah, exactly. Same thing with vinyl records, Rockstars. I mean, like it's... You you have to re EQ it coming off of the needle off the record, sort mm -hmm. of straighten it out again. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Awesome stuff. Uh, how do you feel like the sound of your records has changed over the years since you started your own studio? I mean, you know, when I asked even the saturation question, you know, a fair question is: Would you have felt the same way about a plug-in saturation slash distortion? You know. 15 years ago as you do today or well, have they improved? I'm I'm mixing differently than I did last year. I mean, and this goes into um, the concept of being curious. Um, I mean, there's records that I've mixed that I go, that w I walked away feeling really proudly about going, oh, that, I can't, records sound so good. And then listen to it 10 years later and you go, Jesus, what the fuck was I thinking? You know? Um, but you, you know, that's how you, no one comes out of, you know, Picasso doesn't drop on the floor as a newborn, you know, it's, you've got to, you've got to be willing to make mistakes in order to learn, you know, and you've got to be okay with that. You can't overthink that stuff. You can't go, well, I can't mix this or I shouldn't do this because I'm not qualified to do it. That's bullshit. 
You know, the only way, the only way you get qualified to do it is to do it. So you got to remain curious. You've got to, you've got to allow yourself um, enough rope and grace to hang yourself and then hope it works. And if it doesn't, well, do something different, you know, try, try something different next time. You know, it's, it's, this is how we get better at what we do. You know, I mean, I cannot tell you how many publishing demos I've mixed. Thousands. Right. That I must mean, have been a great learning experience just through repetition. Oh, through it's just, you know, I mean, thousands of them. And 99.9% .9 of them were cut in a studio with a live band. And even more challenging, they're cut so quickly that some of the critical decisions you make before you take the photograph through the glass weren't made. You know, oh, maybe we should try a different guitar. Maybe we should try a different mic. It was like, nope, plug it in, go. That sounds great. Next, you know? So you're getting stump something um, that sounds like a record, theoretically, because you're getting something that is um, well-played um, and the parts are normally... Um, it's so funny, man, when you hear publishing demos, um, you know, demos now are done by a lot of laptop jockeys, right. you know, they're, they're, they're not cut like they used to cut, which is with a live band on the floor. Yeah. Uh, publisher, you know, it used to be a publisher would say, yeah, this, we're going to take this song to the floor, which means they were like, okay, we're going to go, we're going to go cut it with a band. If they felt like it was a good enough song to do that. If not, you just do acoustic vocal demo. Right. Um, and hope the song doesn't surface. Um, so now the way they're done, when I say, by the way, I don't mean to be, um, uh, I'm not trying to be uh, adversarial by saying laptop jockeys. That's just a... Not uh, disparaging. It's just true. It's just the truth. It's, just, like, it's the truth. People it's, become capable of whipping up, you know, digital drums and creating a whole thing. What about so, bass? Does bass get MIDI bass? Oh, well? I mean, I got to tell you something, man. I've heard some incredible, there's so many incredible producers and programmers in Nashville now. It's mind boggling. So here's what's happened over the last, um, over the last five years. I mean, six years, maybe a little longer than that. I mean, that work has dried up. It was like someone turned off a hose mm. because here's what publishers are doing now. Publishers are signing track guys. When I say track guy, this is what I mean. A guy that can sit behind a laptop and put together a track really quickly, fly loops around, it's not uncommon for track guys, and this is not, again, not a, not a dig at track guys. It's, it's not necessarily my cup of tea, but there are track guys that may not be able to tell you the difference between a D sus and a D chord uh, because they're working with loops and samples. So what they're looking at is they're looking at color. They're mm -hmm. looking at a palette of, you know, a vibe. And um, it used to be a publisher would, the writers would write the song, um, they would show up to the publisher. The publisher would say, yeah, the song's good. Let's take it to the floor. Um, they would book, um, a session in a studio and have demo players play on the session. And they would always, you know, it, it's fascinating to go to one of these sessions because you have these players that are just unbelievable. They work really quickly. Uh, they've got great instincts, great sounds, and they listen to the song chart it as they're listening, you go in, you talk it through, you cut it, boom, next song. Yeah. And you get an instant band quality. You get an instant it. band quality and all that stuff. So, um, you know, what, what's going on now though is, uh, in doing so, they would always kind of group the session. They would book like a 10 and, uh, you know, maybe at a 10 o'clock session, uh, uh, they would book, they would cut five songs mm -hmm. and, say maybe there would be one writer that would be uh, the continuous, um, uh, the con con constant through those group of songs. But then like maybe the first two songs, this writer wrote with these two writers. And then the second two songs, these, this writer wrote with these two writers. And then the fifth song was maybe a solo writer with another writer, or maybe, you know, maybe they'd be all the writers. We don't know. Um, but the publishing companies would, if there's three writers on a song, then you're dealing with uh, a $2,400 budget as opposed to an $800 budget for a solo right per song. So it increases the ability to be able to blow the song out a little more. When you, mm. That's how the publishers would 
That's why there's co-writing, and that's how the demo stuff would work. Interesting. So now, but in that process... So the more, the merrier, in a way. Well, it just it just makes the bank bigger. So they can book a nice studio, put a band on the floor, and then they would do like a 10, 2, and a 6, and they would cut, you know, 15 songs in a day, the band would, you know? Um, and they might have, in those contexts of those three sessions, they might have players come in and out of the sessions, you know? Like with the Tracy Nelson record, we had a keyboard player for two days, Steve Kahn. And he played for the first two days. And then we had Kevin McKendry come in on day three, or half of day two and then day three. So we kind of staggered the players to change up the flavor a little bit. Um, and that's that'll happen a lot of time in these demo sessions. Um, but now what's happening is, oh, let me back up again. Um, you cut the songs, and then the singer's got to, you got to have a, an artist or a, a writer that can sing. And if the writer can't sing, like me, I write, but you don't ever want to put me under a microphone unless you want to hear the sound. Except of, for podcasts. In, <laughs> except for podcasts. It's the sound of death. Um, it's the sound of a song not getting cut. Um but they'll they'll bring a singer in. Like, like when I first moved into my studio, I'd get calls from Warner Chapel or calls from writers, and they'd say, "Hey, we're sending you five songs. We're sending over these singers. Cut the singers, you know, cut the vocals, and and then mix the track." Um, so then there's the back half of that expense, which is the overdub and then the mix. So um, what happens is, as music changes and as people's attention spans get shorter. Um, creative directors of publishing companies don't want stuff that sound like demos. They want stuff that sounds like records. Right. So the pressure's on your shoulder to figure out how to make this track sound like a record. And uh, it gets complicated because sometimes there's engineering issues. Sometimes there's playing issues. Sometimes writers would show up at the studio and go, man, I wish that guitar part was different. Would you mind cutting the guitar part for that? Sure, I'll do it. You know, absolutely. Right. You know, so it gets, it can get complicated. And through that process, you're waiting, the publisher is waiting sometimes up to a month to hear the song, right? And sometimes, uh, so what has happened now is artists in this town uh, who don't traditionally write are, are understand that because the dollar value is shrinking in album sales and all this other stuff, another source of income for the artist is to be a writer. And some of these artists are not writers, but they're taking a piece of the pie. So what the publisher does is the publisher signs a track guy. Now the track guy might be a writer, might not, but he can do tracks really quickly. So the publishing company may send the track guy. And I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing. I'm just dumbing all of this down. It's not that way with every track guy. There's some amazingly talented producers in this town. So I'm, I don't want to be disrespectful to these guys um, or insinuate that they can't do something. You know, I'm, please do not read anything into what I'm saying. I'm just dumbing things down to give the example. Uh, what the publisher would do is they have an artist and the artist is wanting to write. So you send, you, the publisher goes, all right, well, I'm going to send a track guy and I'm going to send a really good writer with this, in, with this group. So what they do is they get a song done and at the end of the day, they get the track, the demo done because the track guy's working, cutting a vocal on the fly, mixing it, printing it hot, sending it out. Boom, mm -hmm, done. Mm -hmm. Next one. And the publisher- Writer makes sure it's great. Artist makes sure the vocals sound like a real singer. Right. And the artist feels like the artist is engaged in the process, so the artist is more likely to cut the song. And the publisher, who sends in the track guy and the writer, walks away with two-thirds of the copyright. And they get a demo really quickly. Yeah. So it's, you know— Now, it, is, the, is the track guy, are they likely to use MIDI guitar— I mean, even, I've heard— Because, I mean, I know there's a ton of those now that, that are pretty remarkable sounding. Native Instruments has a, man, all these wild— acoustic analog instruments in in the player you know as sample players man i've heard i've heard all kinds of stuff and it's like really believable i've got a friend of mine who's a really good writer and and he'll every now and then he'll shoot me a demo hey check out this song i just wrote and i did the demo at my house and it'll have like this really cool steel guitar part on it's like who's playing steel he goes oh i did that with this plug-in you know what i mean yeah. it's just like okay well it's believable you know uh -huh. 
Do you feel like all the time that you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all of your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen to this quote from one of our students, David. Quote, absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mixing process I've ever been a part of. That was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour session, close quote. Look, I'm so confident that the ultimate mix Mixing Masterclass will take your mixes to the next level, that if you can't get a killer mix within 30 days, I'll give you a full refund, no questions asked. So if you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy-winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and start now by checking out the free preview of the ultimate snare mixing trick, and I'll save a seat for you at the front row table at the Grammys. Well, and the funny thing is the, the converse is, you know, all the times we've been in the studio with a real band and we're trying so hard to make the real instruments sound more like a sample. Like yeah. we've been, we've been there and done that, you know? So it's sort of funny that. It's so funny. I cut a song this morning. A drummer came to the studio. It's a song I wrote uh, with an artist and um, the song is not being used with the artist. So I'm going to uh, redemo it and pitch it for television. Um, that's my goal, at least. Um, so the drummer, who was also a co-writer in the song, came in to play. And it was really fun because the song has this groove to the whole song. And the reason why I use this drummer is he's remarkable. He plays in time. And his velocities are all matched. I mean, there's not stray snare hits in the context of a four-bar phrase. It's all, I mean, if you look at the waveforms with no compression, they're equal from top to bottom. He's remarkable at what he does. And he makes it feel like a real drummer, but sonically, it sounds like what we're accustomed to hearing now, which are samples, which are all the same velocity, mm -hmm. all the same sound. Yeah. So there's a little trick there that you go, okay, we want something to feel real, right? We want it to have the energy but we want all the velocities to match because that's what we're used to hearing. Right. It, you know, he's, you know, just a brilliant drummer. Anyways, the, um, yeah, it's a really interesting time. It's, uh, I had a, this friend of mine who was a writer, this is funny, you know, this is the, the downfall of it or not the downfall of it, but the chink in the armor, as far as I'm concerned. Um, this, uh, friend of mine who, uh, he, he doesn't live in Nashville anymore, but he's an amazing writer, an amazing musician. I think he's back in Texas. Um, he went to a co-write one morning and he got to the studio 15 minutes late, you know? So he walks in, the track guy sitting behind his laptop programming and he has his headphones on and this writer comes in and he pours his coffee and, you know, the guy takes his headphones off and looks at him and goes, how do you think the bridge in this song should go? <laughs> and the writer's like, what song? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, the programmer was doing his job. He well, was getting so, up. It's already he, happening so fast. Yeah, he, he was show up one coffee late. Yeah, he was he was putting something together. He had a vibe and he was chasing it. And that's what they were going to write that day. Yeah. You know, so but to me, that is a lot of times with songs, that's like, you know. Framing the house and putting, you know, putting all the appliances in without putting the walls on. Or putting the roof on it. Right. You, you mean you prefer some of the, the way of having a band play together and write it together or what? I just prefer songs that are thought through. Right. And I think right. that the equation is, although can vary because art is art and art is comes from, you know, different inspirations and stuff. But I feel like, um, and you could look, you can absolutely come up with a track and then write a really cool song to it's done a gazillion times a day in this town and done well. Um, but there's a lot to be said for n writing around the lyric. 
too. I mean, There's, like there is the You're times at- where you know I, a lot of my recent experience is this whole like writing songs from poems things, uh, and, which is really fun to do. But and sometimes I just whip up a track like here's a cool track. It's just me playing drums and guitar and bass because it sounded kind of fun, and then send it to my buddy Sean and he stitches some vocals to it, and that's got one kind of feel. Yeah. But then another time, I think, oh, let me start with this line, and I'm going to write around the phrasing of this line, yeah. and it's a totally different kind of result. It is. It absolutely is. One of the good things, one of the bad things about, God, good, bad, make up your mind. Um, one of the things that I had to learn early on when I was writing is I would come up with a line that I thought was cool, maybe an opening line for a song. And I would marry that line. But the line is just an opening line. It's not the song. Right. You know, the only way to really write a bulletproof song is to write to the hook. And the really good writers are the ones that can hear a track. You know, uh, if you're going to write to a track, if you hear the track and the vibe of the track uh, inspires the lyric, you know, um, but if I were to tell you, if I were to say, Lige, I got a great lyric. I want to I want to write a song with you tomorrow. And you were just not asking any questions about it or anything. You just build a track. And I were to walk in and go, all right, here are the lyrics. And that's the track. Okay. Uh, this doesn't work. You right, know what I mean? Square peg, round hole. Yeah. The vibe's wrong. The prosody's wrong. Right. So it's, uh, you so know. So what's prosody again? The prosody, PR. O S D Y prosody is in with the English language. It, it is, um, it taught, it, it's commonly used to describe the proper or improper accent on a syllable. Um, example, oh, a I was syllable, right? Exactly. Uh, the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. Putting the wrong, the emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> So, um, but in songwriting, it it is uh, the lyric, the vibe of the lyric, and the vibe of the music have got to match. Yeah. Uh, and the examples of songs that I always use, um, I mean, there's so many out there that you can use. There's so many great songs. But when I think of prosody, I think of songs like um, Don Henley's In a New York Minute or um, End of the Innocence. Um. You know, there's, I mean, some of the great writers, Billy Joel, I mean, some of these guys just write songs that are just, you are just, they're adult, they're big boy songs, right? They're not baby shark, do, 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 do. you know, it's not that <laughs> shit. It's what the, did it's, the fox say? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're big boy songs. And they're, and those are the kind of songs that become timeless, I think. Those, are, when I say timeless, I don't mean embraced and loved by many for years to come. But what I mean by timeless is a, you write it, you put it on the shelf. Oh, let's dust this song off five years from now. It's still a good song, you know? I, I hated New York Minute. I had to write about it as a um, project in school. They assigned it to me. Wow. And I was like, I was like, what the hell is this? You know, all I cared about back then were like old, you know, 80s Meat Puppets records yeah, with oh, yeah. tune vocals and stuff, you know? I look, or like Camper Van Beethoven. Man, I love, oh man, oh yeah. I, I mean, I love that stuff, man. It, you know, Husker Du, all that stuff. Bob Mould, Sugar, give me that all day long. Yeah. You know? Of course, now I've been, you know, the owners of the Eagles uh, console, so I appreciate That's Don right. Henley and all those writers, you know, all, <laughs> all those guys. You, yeah. yeah, you've, 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 uh, I learned to really change my thinking on music, songwriting, all of that just being, doing it professionally for decades here in Nashville. It, I still love the same music that I always loved, but I have a, a greater appreciation for the song. When yeah. I, when I came here, you know, I still loved um, Rush because there was a lot of fast notes in it, yeah. you know, and weird time signatures. Yeah. It was cool. It was like, Oh, that's, that's, yeah, you know, like f- fun puzzles, you know, yeah. like again, like scoring a goal on, on the field, you know, doing a trick shot. Yeah. But, um, but learning to appreciate a song for just being a great song and having something in the lyric that moves me and, and means something was a great experience. And I think part of it too is is you you need a little life experience before songs and lyrics. Uh, and I, you know, if you want to disagree, that's fine. Or if anybody does, 
but it's occurring to me that it wasn't until I had my heart broken that the lyrics leapt out of a song on a first listen where I was like, oh my God, that's what that means, you know? Oh my well, God. Well, there's a saying in town that says, there's a saying in town that says, write what you know. Yeah. That's the, 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 the wise sage writers always say, write what you know, because they understand that. If you're going to, if you're going to say, this, this is what I was saying earlier. When I, if I'm writing with a female, I'm going to suggest a lyric, but I'm going to wait until I hear the direction they're going in um, because I'm not a female and I'm not going to lead the conversation. I've done that and I've in sessions before and I've fucked up the experience both for the other writer and my and the opportunity. Yeah. I've done it. I've been bullheaded about stuff. But you know, here's the, you know, and and thought, no, it's got to be this way, and not paying attention to the nuance involved in all that stuff. Here's the thing about audio. Here's the thing about songwriting. Here's the thing about playing an instrument. Here's the thing about life in general. It's like developing your palate. All of it is. It's like you know, when, when I was in high school, there were two types of wine. There were red wine and white wine, you know, don't drink the red wine. You'll get a headache and you'll throw it up, you know? Um, and then yeah, trust me, I did that with the white wine too. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, exactly. Exactly. Um, but over the, over the course of years, you start to learn about wine, the regions, you start to learn about the grapes. Is this a Cabernet? Is this a Merlot? Is this, you know, blah, 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 you know? And then, you know, you start then you start to learn about what wines work with food. You know, you're not going to sit down and order a Cabernet with a fish, a piece of fish, are you? Maybe, but it is, you know, it, it might blend better with a Chardonnay, you know, um, or a Coderone. Yeah, you, know, you know, there's there's so many different there's so many different elements involved in in picking a wine that helps the experience become a better experience. And it's the exact same thing with music. Yeah. It's the exact same thing with mixing elements in, when you mix a track. You know, the more you do it, the more de uh, defined your palate becomes. You know, and I think the number one thing is when you, if you want to, if you want to mix, if you want to write, if you want to do that stuff, you kind of got to develop your voice. Because what it does is, you know, like when I mix something, I had a friend tell me once, um, that he knew he could tell one of my mixes from, you know, if I played one of my mixes amongst others that he could tell it was my mix. Uh, now I don't know what those elements are. He, uh, has an opinion about what those elements are and what, what he hears and how I approach something. But I do know that I, there's ways that I like things to sound. There's certain ways when I go to mix a song, there are certain things that, um, I shoot for. And those are based upon uh, impact. Mm -hmm. I feel like impact is really important. You don't control where the song goes. It's going to end up on Spotify playlist between two bigger budget songs. If it doesn't stand up, people are going to either consciously or subconsciously uh, dismiss it. Um, or go, oh, yeah, that's nice. Or, you know, or it could be cool. I mean, look at Jay Joyce. I mean, he does, he makes records that are bold and daring. And, but there are things that Jay does production wise. Um, but his records don't sound like other records. Mm. And that's what makes Jay, Jay Joyce, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so there, you know, if you develop your voice, if you develop what it is, your, your, your ideology, your sound, if you develop your thumbprint, I guess, or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, the more you can make it your own, um, what that does is that helps define who's going to come to you, um, which means that you are going to have opportunities uh, to do the stuff that you love to do and get paid for it, as opposed to the stuff you have to do to get paid for. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I, I think part of that too is remembering to, do the things that you want to do. Um, copying is a great, you know, the sincerest form of flattery or whatever, right? Um, but at the same time, if you're always trying to copy everything else, uh, you know, you might not find your voice. You might have to just let some stuff happen the way you, you, your own wacky vision for it. And then once you make it, you got to share it. Yeah. If you don't share it, 
Nobody's going to know that you had that voice. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and, and again, you know, I know a lot of people that write great songs that aren't interested in anyone ever hearing them, you know, that are just, they do it because it's something that they love to do. Right. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're wanting to uh, support yourself, if you're wanting to tack on the second word in the phrase, which is music business, if you're going to, if you're going to, um, if you're going to tack on that second word in a phrase, then you've got, there's some things you've got to figure out. Right. And everyone's tolerances are different. Everyone's vision is different. Everyone's objectives are different. Everyone's motives are different. Um, and you've got to figure out what it is that makes you want to go to work every day. You know, whatever it is, whatever it is. Um, dude, let me go to this question. Yes. This one I've asked you once before. Twice before, actually. <laughs> so this is going to be the third time. This is our hypothetical question. We're going to take the way back studio machine. <laughs> and you get to go back in time, find young Raj, and say, listen, dude, this is the single most important thing you need to know to become a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you like to go back and give yourself this well, time? Well, that might be different than that might be different than the other two answers I've given you. Uh, because again, it changes, I, you know, every year you, 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 you know, you yeah, morph you new, and change your advice to your old self. I, to me, um, I think the, the most important thing is if you go into the studio to work is to understand what your role is, is to understand uh, if you're engineering to understand what that role demands and to make sure that you are prepared for that. If you're producing, understand what that role is. And again, that role changes the, or the, the dimensions of that role, the width of that role changes from project to project. Um, so, you, you know, you kind of got to understand what it is, um, and be able to be willing and able to do the work to make sure that when the client or the artist leaves the studio, that they're getting what they paid for, you know? Yeah. Um, if you're presented with something that you don't want to do, it's real easy to say I'm busy. This podcast is proud to present Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then and check out Rock Stars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I master my own records using nothing but plugins. Plus, I take you into a world class mastering studio, Sterling Sound, to meet with Ryan Smith and hear how he professionally mastered my record, Skadoosh, for release to streaming platforms. That's the music you hear on this podcast, Rock Stars. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free mixing course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins and Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even upload to your website if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash academy to get started now. I feel like that's been my uh, most successful experiences in the studio are the ones where I set out to deliver, find out what the client I'm working with is wants to get done and deliver that, Yeah, you know, with hopefully a version of my own stamp on it. But I also feel like sometimes the version of your own stamp, and I don't mean that in a way that I'm like trying to put my, you know, this is the Lidge thing, not them. But I mean, you know, like the letting your voice out, like you're talking about. I feel like sometimes the voice just comes out. You can't help using, finding your voice if you just are doing it enough and, and helping give people what it is that they need in that session, whether it was Bonnaroo and, you know, bands coming in for three hours and we got to just record it as fast as we can, make them comfortable. Or, uh, you know, artists like Hunter Cross, who I work with now, who will come in and he just wants to like, at the end of the day, he wants something he can release on Spotify. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, okay. All right. So like, like your demos, it forces me to, to, 
go through it quickly, not get stuck on things, and then say, like, how am I going to mix this so that it's, you know, master level, ready to go out? Yeah. And I won't, uh, I'm sure I'd find something wrong with it if I look for something, but how do I make sure that I mostly don't, you know? Well, it's interesting. I, you know, you remember years ago, you did a record on an artist and we had a killer band. Yeah. Um, it Ryan was, Humbert. Right, right. That's right. And uh, it was me. It was Oddly Freed. It was, uh, who was playing bass? Uh, um, that was, um, I'll have it for you in a minute. Daniel Tashin was on that project. Uh, the drummer from uh, the Counting Crows was on that project. What was his name? His uh, funny guy. God, I love that guy. Uh, yeah, that was, um, uh, I'll have that for you in a moment too. <laughs> so the point being is that record was so much fun because we, you, you gave the band an opportunity. I wasn't, I was just playing guitar. I wasn't doing it. Yeah. I think I did a little engineering on that, but for the most part, I was there to play guitar and which I really enjoyed because I wasn't thinking about the big picture stuff. I was just making sure I was intonated and playing the right part. Um, but it was so fun because you busted your butt to make a great record. And that record is considerably different than the record you played me a little while ago, the stuff that you wrote with your friends. Two different, two different scenarios, right? But your talent, your ability to make that adjustment, you know, that comes from experience, that comes from years of doing it, you know? You, when you're able to corral a bunch of guys in a room on a cutting floor, um, and it pull out ideas out of the guys and able to put together a record like Ryan has. It was just, I mean, that record sounds great. It, it's awesome. You busted your butt on that record. It is a beautiful body of work. It was um, really fun to do. Oh. It was, so, it was so many great people on that. And it was just a lot of fun to go pursue all these different things. But it was also one of those ones that in some ways became one of those classic stories uh, for me of producing the, sh the crap out of an artist and then creating something that couldn't necessarily be replicated back on the stage when they had to go support it as an independent artist. Uh, we've I've all made that, that mistake. Yeah, I've learned that lesson a few times, yeah. you know, because... Yeah, it's funny, man. I, um, you know, I, I've had a very similar experience recently. And, um, you know, you kind of have these conversations. Look, here's, here's what I do. Um, I always ask the artist, what do you think about this? What do you think? Do you, is this cool? Do you like this idea? Do you like this approach? If they say no, then we shift gears. If they say yes, then I put the pedal to the metal and, and go down the road. I'm always giving the artist an opportunity to say, I don't like that. And if they say, I don't like that, I've got to pay attention to that. Um, but it is easy because we're working, you know, it is easy to create something that is harder to replicate in a studio scenario. But my mindset is also records are forever. When you go to make a record, it is a snapshot in time. It is something that is, is out of your control where it's going to be played, under what circumstances people are going to hear it. So you got to make the best record possible. And then whatever you do live, fuck it. I don't care. You know, if you want to go fart, into a megaphone and recite poetry while doing so, awesome. Knock yourself out, you know? Um, but understand as an artist, you know, if I'm producing something and I'm asking these questions, understand that I'm working based upon the, out, the input that I'm giving and the advice or the reflection, the bounce back that I'm getting from the artist. Um, and sometimes... Sometimes you don't get a clear answer or an honest answer. Sometimes you create something that is difficult to, to replicate. I don't, you know, to me, that's not really, I don't really get tied up in that. I mean, I just, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, it's fun to just make records the way you want to make them too and not even worry about that. Um, well, dude, we've gone for a good long clip here. Uh, how I want to thank you for being on the podcast again, dude. It's always a pleasure to hang out. Oh, with man. You, man. I love having you here. I love, I glad love. to have you here in Podzilla. <laughs> um, let the Rockstars know where can they go find out more about you? What if they're ready to just make their next hit record, get a mix done, come, come work with you or just got questions for you. Um, uh, Roger Allen Nichols.com R O G E R A L A N N I C H O L S. Um, Roger Allen Nichols.com. 
Facebook.com uh, on Instagram at Bell Tone Recording is um, or Roger or at Roger Allen Nichols. That one you don't want to go to because unless you like dogs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, you know, I mean, um, they can email you if they want to. You know, sure, you can always reach me, Roger. Um, and we'll have links in the show notes too. So we have. Yeah. Links to the website for Roger and um, also Roger's discography. So you can click through and listen. If you go to all cool music, records. if you go to, yeah, if you go to all music uh, and put in Roger Allen Nichols, and the reason why I say Allen is there's another Roger Nichols, there's two yeah. other Roger Nichols. Yeah. One's a famous songwriter who worked with people like John Denver and yada, yada, yada. The other one is Roger Nichols who produced Steely Dan. And, you know, in that order, a little bit of confusion, there's a little confusion there. And I got to tell you something, man, when early on, when I started producing, I had to, I had to start using my middle name because there was so much confusion in that, you know, and it was, it was, uh, it was obnoxious. Did so, you ever say like, thanks mom, thanks dad. Why didn't you just tell me to pick a different career in the <laughs> beginning? <laughs> well, it's, it's one of the things that, that caused me to be curious about producing is seeing Roger Nichols on, I loved listening to the Steely Dan records, you know, that yeah. he worked on. I thought that they were just brilliantly produced and executed. And, um, so when you see, a, when you're a kid, when you're a small kid looking at a credit and you see your name in a credit and you love music, it's like, oh, wow, that's interesting. You know, you become curious, you know, and you, you know, not that it, but he did live in town. When I moved to town, he was living here. And, uh, there was a lot of uh, crossed messages and phone calls that I would get where people thought they were talking to him and uh, they were talking to me. <laughs> right. Oh, wow. And that was some very, very entertaining conversations. Well, that's probably better than, um, you know, me getting a phone call as the Toy Box Studio and somebody was thinking it was the Toy Box, the adult, uh, <laughs> the adult sex toy store <laughs> down the street. <laughs> um, oh. Dude, great to always see you. Uh Thanks for coming and being on the show with us. My Rockstars, pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. And Raj, uh, we'll see you around the studio. Maybe I'll see you uh, over a margarita before then. Uh, I hope so. All right, man. Talk All to right. you soon, dude. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rock stars now go make great music recording studio rock stars would like to give a big thank you to our awesome sponsors who helped make this episode possible grace design adam audio native instruments and isotope and remember at isotope.com and nativeinstruments.com, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plugin purchase. If you enjoyed recording Studio Rockstars, please check out our sponsors using the links in our show notes because it's a great way to help support this show. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Streming, and Liz Hulitskaya. Thanks so much for listening, Rockstars, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.